I want to take a minute to honor the woman of this house, Pastor Lucinda. Pastor Lucinda was the first woman pastor to encourage me to embrace my feminine side and to not listen to the world when the world tells you that you should be an alpha female. Let me set some of y'all free. There's no such thing as an alpha female because if it's not in the word, I don't want to do it. There's beauty in our femininity. There's beauty in our softness. And one of the things you said when your book came out, I had your book and then I loaned it and then they kept it. I should have had a little card where you check it out and maybe I keep your license or something and then you get it back. So now I got to get another book. But when you released that book, you talked about being your husband's playground and not his problem. I married the same man twice. So I was not trying to be divorced. And I've been single uh, for 18 years. And God has just been phenomenally good to me. And I am nothing but grateful. But I do look forward to being my future husband's playground. The slide the monkey bars, all of that. If he don't never pick up no trash, I do not care. Y'all women who complain about what your husband don't do, talk to a single woman. She'd be happy to do it. Or if you just lean over and get the trash and be like, babe, can you, can, can you help me with the trash? I bet you he'll pick up the trash then. Hey, man. I love your woman of God. So much wisdom in there. A long relationship. I wanted to talk about speaking fierce love, and I wanted to share some of my story with you because I do feel like in here, a lot of you have a lot of reasons not to love. And I get that. And you might be looking at me and thinking, but Pastor Dion, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I have experienced. Can I tell you that the grace of God makes sure that you don't look like what you've been through? That's the beauty of who God is. Because the cliff notes in my book, and if you want to read the long version, it's out in the foyer. The cliff notes, I watched my stepfather try to murder my mother when I was five. I was sexually abused by a family member from 13 to 18 because he convinced me that we would be together for the rest of our lives and that it would be possible for us to get married. Then when I moved out of the house, I became very promiscuous. I ran a strip club in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. I know, I saw some of y'all right there just go, it's all right, it's all right. Y'all ain't got no heaven or hell to put me in. I'm just telling you the truth about what happened. I'm okay with who I am. Because there's a mighty God that escorted me through some things that should have killed me. There's a mighty God that got me through some stuff that should have taken me out. If I was the devil, I'd be mad at me too. Am I in the right house? So I ran a strip club. There was a season where I was suicidal. There was a different season where I was homicidal. There was a season where I was on medication to get up and on medication to come down. There was a season where I did drugs to go to work because I wasn't happy about where I was working. When you work at a strip club and you have other people come in and say, you don't belong here. The Lord can speak through anybody at any moment, at any time, to speak into your life, to remind you about who you are. And I'm going to tell you the revelation that the Lord gave me, that I came to give you, is that once the Lord convinced me that he loved me, and I mean he had to convince me. Anybody in here, the Lord had to convince you. Lord, after all that I've been through, what do you mean you love me? He said, but I died for you. I love you. I know that other people use their free will to violate your free will, but that wasn't me. I'm good and I'm only good. I have a plan for your life if you'll just say yes. I want to love you if you will let me in. The best part about who God is is that when God already chose to love you, he does not change his mind. 
There's nothing that you've done and there's nothing that you will do that will make God change his mind because he already sent his son. That blood was already poured out. That liquid love ran on a cross for you so that you could be completely free. And when you are free, whom the son sets free is free indeed. That's why I can stand and tell my story. That's why I can carry my mat everywhere I go. Because when God heals you, you'll carry your mat boldly. You'll carry your mat proudly. That's where I was, but this is where I'm going. That's who I was, but this is who I am. I used to live this kind of life, but because of Jesus Christ and him crucified, I'm now in the best life that I never knew I always wanted. God has the ability to give you the best life you never knew you always wanted. And then he made me a pastor. Lord, you have got to be kidding me. You do know some people think that the church is the name of a club. I'm from West Monroe, Louisiana. When I moved out, I moved to Arizona. I got connected with Living Word. Amen. Praise God. That was back in the 90s. Amen. And then I went back home to visit some of my friends. And, you know, sometimes you try to go back to what you used to be around because you just want to let everybody know how you're doing. First of all, most of them don't care because you're not doing what you used to do when you was running with them. So they're not trying to check up on you. But I went back and they're like, where do you work? I work at Living Word, you know, Bible Church. I work at a church. They're like, man, that's a bomb name for a club. No, it's a church. No, that's cool. Do y'all wear like little outfit? It's a church. Like a real church? Where people pray? Yeah. They let you in a church. Yeah. Shut up. No. You clowning, you clowning. No, I work at a church. Show me the website. They're like, oh, you can't stay in here. You got to go. John 8, 36 says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. It's really important for us to understand that when God chose to love you in the beginning, that he never changes his mind. Why is that so important? Because once you allow God to love you, then you can allow the love of God to empower you. And you are able to do some things you would have never imagined. The person who abused me, I completely forgave before he went home to be with the Lord. That's liberty. Because I had already committed to the Lord, I will carry no debt in my heart for any man. Because I am nothing but grateful. Because when the Lord sees you, he sees you through the blood of Jesus. You are the righteousness of God. How can I judge you if God didn't judge me? Because Jesus came to stand in the proxy for me and take the beating that I deserved and paid the price that I could never pay so that when God sees me, all he sees is his son. I don't keep receipts on people like I did back in the day. I could tell you what you did in the 70s. I could tell you what you did in the 80s. I could tell you about the $20 you owed me from the 90s. I could tell you how you rolled your eyes at me when we was at church and you didn't speak to me and stuff and stuff. And when the love of God completely fulfills you, you just let go of it. If it's not important in eternity, I'm not going to allow it to be important in my life in the earth realm. So guess what? I don't need you to like me. I appreciate if you like me, but I'm cool if you don't. Because I've already decided to love you. And guess what? There's nothing you can do about it. Pastor Dion, I like your hair cut short. I don't really like it in braids. I don't care. God bless you. I didn't want to comb my hair for a couple of weeks. So I got some braids. Pastor Dion, I don't know if I like them shoes with that outfit. It's okay. It's okay. You want me to have on some different shoes? Size nine. Why do we as women make everything such a big deal? 
Somebody don't like your outfit. Do you like your outfit? If you don't like how you look in the outfit, go and get you some Spanx. Or if you was like me when I was 200 pounds, you couldn't talk to me. You couldn't tell me my name because I thought I was all of that. 200, I was cute. Losing weight was because I have a long journey and this is a tent. This is a one-way tent. It goes back to the kingdom where it came from, but it's a tent. So if you don't treat it right, it might not hold up for the whole trip. So God intended for you to have 100 years or 120 years, but if you drink and smoke and snort and coke, doing hair and, and all kind of shenanigans, your tent may not last. So I had to learn how to treat my tent better. I got a trainer. I started going to the gym. Lord have mercy. And I'm not going to be like the CrossFit queen. I love working out. That is not my truth. That is not my truth. Pastor Dion, do you like working out? No, I do not. But I love the results of working out. Pastor Dion, do you love uh, fasting? No, I do not. Because a sister likes to eat. But I like the results of fasting. And so if you want kingdom results, you got to take a kingdom approach. See, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. So I'm a kingdom citizen, so I don't act like an earthling. So expensive gas don't make me nervous because my daddy knows how to get me the right resources to get more gas or he going to tell me to strategically plan all my errands so I use less gas. Kingdom citizens don't pay retail. Those are the kind of things that I just believe in because I'm not just an earthling. I'm a kingdom citizen. I just happen to exist on the earth. So when we look at love and we talk about loving fiercely, what I want to talk to you about is reaching beyond the breach. Because when God convinced me that he loved me, he said, I want you to be the conduit that brings your family together. I don't want to do that. I don't even like all of them. And you know they don't like me. You know they don't. But God can do incredible things with your yes. You have to decide to become unoffendable. I am as close to unoffendable. I am, I am 53 years old. I'm as close to unoffendable as I have ever seen me be. You just, you can't, the stuff that used to get me all in a tizzy and a tantrum in my 20s, don't even get my eyebrow raised in my 50s. Because I've been through some things. I've seen some miracles. I've been through some hardships. I've been through some tribulation. I've been through some tragedy, but I have seen the sovereignty of God. I have seen the mightiness of the Father. I've seen the goodness of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the stuff that used to get my attention now, I'm like, in Jesus' name. Put some Jesus on it. Not in my name, because my name don't go very far. But put some Jesus on it. In Jesus' name, this will be what I say it is, because it lines up with the word of God. Because of the blood of Jesus and Jesus Christ and him crucified, I can command, I can decree, I can declare. Because God gave me, gave us dominion and authority. So what are you going to do with your dominion and your authority? You need to rule well. So I want to be characterized by love. Pastor Dion, just, she'll love you. I love you. I'm not going to judge you. Why? It serves me no purpose. Weighing and measuring you back in the day would make me feel better, but only temporarily. But when I lift you up with the love of God, you know, we can all shine together. That's the beauty of a flower. Turn to your sister and say, you're a beautiful flower. You know what I love about flowers? You don't ever see flowers compete. Amen. You don't ever see flowers fighting for position. Carnation, you two ahead of me. I'm a rose. I need to sit right here. Orchid, why are you trying to be all tall when I'm real short? Because I'm a dandelion. Sunflower, why you got to be so big, taking up so much space? Flowers don't compete. They just bloom. So you can shine. I can shine. 
We shine for Jesus and the light gets bigger and brighter and more brilliant. And it shines in a dark world that needs the light that Jesus put inside of us. So here's what the Lord told me. You know, love for the world has a posture. The world's love wants you to have your fists up, wants your mouth to be running, talking sideways at people, or your thumbs, them text messages, you fire it off, sin. And then you waiting on the three little dots, say something. Because I got the next one in my notes. I'm just waiting to cut and paste it. Play with me if you want to. But the Dion who has been redeemed by the blood, you can text me whatever shenanigans you want to text. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. Why? Because my ability to love you is not based on your ability or your decision to reciprocate. I just choose to love. Period. Because that's what Jesus did for you. So what's the posture of love in the kingdom? I need to receive it. It's already offered. It's a free gift. So I'm going to receive it. I'm going to surrender to it. Then I'm going to obey it. And then I'm going to sow it into somebody else. You want to live a life that's completely free? 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let love and kindness be the motivation behind all that you do. You know you are unstoppable when you're dressed and drenching in love. That's undeniable. I don't know what it is about her. It's the love of God. Why is she always in a good mood? It's the love of God. Why is she not stressed? It's the love of God. Why is she not offended? Why is she not mad? It's the love of God. When you look at your husband and you look at him through the blood of Jesus, you're like, Lord, have mercy. You is sure enough good. You so handsome. You so strong. Yeah. I just, I just want to sit by you and watch a football game. Girl, you better learn football or basketball or soccer or golf, badminton, whatever he want to teach. I want to sit. Now, what does that mean again? What? Oh, first and goal. I, what, what, what is that? Try to have no conversation with your husband in the middle of the game. Don't have a conversation with me in the middle of the game. In the New King James Version, it says, let all that you do be done with love. With love. Love turns away harsh words and wrath. Your kids are wilding out. Pray for them and love them. Pray for them and love them. Ooh, them kids, they get on my nerves. They your kid. Ask your mama. Maybe you got on her nerves. But they your kid. How you going to be mad when it's your kids? I don't even understand that. I used to be the director of children's church, and parents would come in. I don't know what I'm going to do with these kids. You've had 10 years to practice. Put some Jesus on them. My little, little, little Ted just don't want to come to church. Why does little Ted get to have a conversation about going to church? When we get up on Sunday morning, we go to church. That's what we do. My kids were growing up, church camp, a youth conference. I'd be like, Saturday, I'm dropping y'all off because it's a youth conference. We didn't know. I didn't ask you. I'm just dropping you off and I'll pick you up when it's over. You'll have a great time. Bless you. They some cheering. I mean, that's how we say it in the South. They some cheering. So with your cheering, why am I including you in the conversation when I should be getting my directives from the king? Because I'm a kingdom citizen. I run a kingdom household. So the king is in charge. And whatever the king says to do, those are the statues and the precepts and the principles that we will live by in this kingdom household. Because even though this kingdom household exists in the earth realm, it's still a kingdom household. It makes you a good wife. It makes you a good mother. It makes you a good business owner. It makes you a good churchgoer. It makes you a good believer. 
Lord, with your face all squeezed up and you trying to talk to me about Jesus, I don't know who he is, but I'm not sure I want to meet him. If you're the one that's going to introduce me. How are you today? I'm fine. You sure? Where are you going? We're on our way to church. Really? I get up on Sunday, I'm like, we're going to church. We're going to church. We're going to church. And you can hear me all across the foyer. What's up, family? Good morning. And I don't do that just because I work there. It's because I love God. Because I'm grateful for all that God has done for me. So when I come in his house, I'm like, Lord, what you want to do today? Look, ask my armor bear. She's right here. Sophia. She got on this shirt that say hood and holy. Uh, Pastor Kimberly, I'm going to need that shirt. And the other one that say hell shaker. I'm going to need them two shirts. When we woke up this morning, I was all humming in my bed. I was like, hmm. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, the Holy Spirit woke me up and was like, good morning, daughter. I was like, oh, Jesus, you want to talk to me? He goes, you want to talk to me? I do want to talk to you. What do you want to talk about? He goes, well, let's pray in the Holy Spirit. I would love to pray in the Holy Spirit. So I'm praying in the Holy Spirit. I'm talking to him. And I'm just as lighthearted and having such a good time. I put on some worship music. I'm like, is it time to get up yet? Is it like I'm like a little kid? Because it's a life that's baptized and saturated and steeped in the love of God. You can't be mad when that's your motivation. Proverbs 3.3 3 says, do not let mercy and kindness and truth leave you. Instead, let these qualities define you. Bind them securely around them, around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. I don't want anything written on my heart that God did. So sometimes you're going to have to hit a reset button. Sometimes you're going to have to get a delete button. And not the delete that goes in the recycle bin, but the delete that you can't get back. Lord, I want a complete system overhaul. I want to think like you think. I want to talk like you talk. I want to act like you act. 1 John 3.18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our action. It would take you 10 seconds to send a text that says, I love you and I'm thinking about you. In fact, I want to challenge every woman who's in here. The people that God has put in your life that you know have been a positive influence, reach out to them and remind them of that. Because when you know the Lord, you do know where you're going at the end of your days. You go from here to eternity. But every day is not promised. And there's a lot of people who went home to be with the Lord during the pandemic. So I make sure that as the Lord speaks to me, I just remind people that they matter. I remind people that they're important because that's what Jesus does for us. Every day he reminds us that we're important. How does he do that? The homeless person at Circle K that you bought a coffee for. The homeless person at Walmart that you brought groceries for. The person in the restaurant when you saw him, you're like, oh, I know them. I just want to bless them for lunch. That's Jesus reminding you that you matter because he's touching other lives through you and through your willingness to obey his word, and his heart. Is this blessing you? Last scripture, and I'm going to share a testimony with you. Ephesians 5, 2. Continue to walk surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ, for he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love for us was pleasing to God, like an aroma of adoration, a sweet healing fragrance. In the New Living Translation, it says, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. You ever pass by somebody that smell good? Male or female, you, they just pass by and you're like, what, what are you wearing? Man, you smell good. Love smells good. The aroma of Jesus Christ and him crucified smells good. It draws people to you. It leaves a fragrance wafting in the room. I want to share with you what the love of God did in my life. I have uh, a picture that I, I sent the team, and I'm going to ask them to put the first picture up. These are my siblings 
on my dad's side. You notice? <laughs> because the Lord, that weekend, the Lord had me on a mission to speak love. And sometimes he tells you to do things. You're like, are you sure about this? He's like, I got you. I'm like, all right, all right. <sighs> I'm going to put my big girl panties on and I'm going to get it. These are my siblings on my dad's side. Four children, four moms, same dad. We didn't grow up together. We didn't know each other. But the Lord asked me to reach across the breach and to pull our family together. And so I reached out to them. They were living in Vegas. And I said, I just want, for my 45th birthday, I want us to all spend some time together. Now, let me tell you the truth. I had to die to my flesh. I don't know your mama. I don't know who your mama raised you to be. I just know what my past looks like. I know who I am. I know that I'm redeemed by Christ. But when you're talking about reconciling a family that doesn't really know it, like they grew up together, I'm the odd one out. So here's the enemy. You don't even look like them. You ain't even the same shade of black. They darker than you. You light. They don't like you. They won't like you. What if they hear you work at a church and they don't want to hear what you got to say? So you know what I did? I just went in with love. I didn't go with a secret agenda. You will say the salvation prayer because I need to know where you're going when you die. No. Maybe you're just called to plant the first seed. Somebody else is going to come and water it. Somebody else is going to come and water it some more. Somebody else is going to come and water it some more. And before you know it, it's going to burst through the ground. You ain't got to do it all. You just got to do your part. My siblings and I, we talk regularly. They're all saved. It was years. Like the Lord told me to start working on that when I was 40. I'm 53. The first time we hung out together was when I was 45. And we've been, they've been to my house. I've been to their house. Only the love of God can do that. But you got to get over yourself about the obstacles that could be there. Women are great at creating narratives that aren't even the truth. My siblings represent every 10 years. So I'm in my 50s now. My sister in the blue is in her 40s. My other sister is in her 30s. My brother is two years older than my daughter. My brother is 28 years old. My oldest child is 26. Isn't that crazy? So I'm meeting them and I'm like, really? I'm old enough to be your mama. How are you going to look at me as a big sis? But he calls me. He's like, sis, let me tell you what I did on my job. Or sis, he's a dad. He's got, I got two little nieces. God is a God of relationship. And God tries to build, or he seeks to build generationally. That's why the enemy fights generations. Because the enemy seeks to destroy generationally. And when he can get a stronghold or a generational curse going, what he wants is he wants it to grow in every generation until it destroys itself. The love of God is the perfect solution to that because the love of God will build generationally. Now my kids know their aunt and their uncle. Now, their kids are going to know their Aunt Dion. It don't matter if she work at a church. That's not the most important thing about me. The most important thing about me is that I'm a daughter of the king and that I know who Jesus is and by salvation. That's what's important. So when I speak love, it has nothing to do with my church. And, and my sister, one of my, one of my siblings is married. The others are single. But my sister who's married, her husband hasn't been in a church in years, like a decade. And he came to church when they drove to, from Vegas to Arizona to hang out with me. And he sat in the car. And he said, sis, sis, I, I think I'm going to need a cigarette. Okay. Smoke your cigarette. Help yourself. We don't allow smoking in the foyer, but you in the parking lot, smoke all you want to. We don't care. Ain't nobody going to put me out the parking lot? No. We don't care. It's not that deep. My founding pastor said when I first got to Living Word, I don't care if you smoke. You're going to get to heaven before I do, but I don't care if you smoke. 
So as long as you ain't smoking in the sanctuary or in the foyer, you smoke all you want to. So my brother's in, and then he comes in into the foyer. He's like, man, that's a pretty cool church. Okay. And then he hangs out in the foyer, but you can hear the service. And then he said, the last time they were here, he goes, next time I come, I think I'm going to go in church. Now, then you can't, like, you can't, you can't overread. You got to be cool. Bro, you do you. You do whatever you feel is right for you. It's cool. No pressure. You want me to hang out out here in the foyer with you? I got you. No, no, I think I'm going to come in church. Okay, cool. And then you got to ease up. You can't be like, oh, hallelujah, glory to God. Yes, I've been praying you would accept Jesus. Yes, come on, let me lead you down front. You can get saved today. No, don't do that. Don't do that. See, love is easy. You got to be a secret agent for Jesus. You got to be stealthy. Jesus hung out with all the people that the other people would tell him don't hang out with because that ain't the right kind of people. I only want to hang out with the people who are not the right kind of people because those are the Jesus kind of people. It's only the religious that Jesus was like, I ain't hanging with y'all. But anybody who looks like they don't fit in or they look unwanted or they look undeserving, those are my people. Let's go to church together. I have one more picture. This is going to blow your mind. Okay. Y'all ready? This is going to blow your mind. The one with the curly hair, that's my oldest. That's Rion. She was born three months premature. I had her when I was six months pregnant, 26 weeks. She's a miracle. My son is the one in the hat, the only dude in the picture. The other two young ladies, the redhead and the little one, those are my children's siblings. Let that sink in. That might hit you in the parking lot. Because you sound like you ain't caught up yet. So let me explain. These are my children's siblings. They all have the same father, but they are three different mothers. My two children and the other two children have different mothers. I have prayed for this picture. This picture happened uh, right before Easter a couple of years ago. And when that picture happened, it was years of praying because I never wanted my children to grow up with my reality, not knowing who their siblings were. Do you know how hard it is to reach across the breach to some other mothers that ain't your friends, you don't have coffee with, y'all ain't real cool, y'all don't exchange Christmas cards, but they have children by the same man you have children for. The love of God is undeniable. It breaks down walls and it breaks down barriers. Sometimes the walls are in you. And once the love of God completely frees you, then the love of God can reach across the breach. In fact, the redhead has never met my ex-husband. That's my next prayer. The reason I just became emotional is the compassion of the Holy Spirit because I felt just that quick. There's some of you that maybe have never met your father. Or if you did meet him, he wasn't who you thought he was. He didn't have the character that you thought he would. And it hurts your heart. But Jesus is so good to us. And God, our Heavenly Father, is so good to us. Do not superimpose someone else's image of a dad onto God. God is benevolent and generous and good, and he's kind, and he's loving, and he will fill you to the overflow. So I'm encouraging you today, let the walls fall. The Lord used me to make that picture happen. Their youngest sibling, she calls me TT. She said, I know I wanted to call you mom. She said, but I know why I can't call you mom. She was maybe 
seven. And I said, why, babe? She goes, because my mommy met daddy after you, and you had already had my brother and my sister. And she said, so what can I call you? I said, whatever is in your heart. She said, can I call you TT? I said, yeah. And we're close. I pray for them. I pray for their future spouses. I pray for their destiny. I pray for their purpose. See, somebody, everybody in this room, there's somebody behind you that prayed for you. There's somebody who prayed that you wouldn't lose your life when you were strung out. There's somebody who prayed that when you went through that abortion, you didn't leave with scars that still haunt you. There's somebody who prayed that you would fall in love with Jesus, that you would allow Jesus to love you. So it's up to us to be that for somebody else. For women who are incarcerated, for women who have siblings that they haven't met, for women who are estranged, Maybe you're estranged from somebody in the family and you're like, I want it to be better, but they're not talking to me. But God is talking. Years. Don't give up and don't give in. And let the love of God through you reach across the breach. What does fierce love look like? It does look like that lioness, but not the way you think. Because our battle is not with flesh and blood with powers and principalities. So I need to battle on my knees. I need to confess. My household is blessed. My children are blessed. They love each other. They love God. They fulfill their destiny. They fulfill their purpose. Lord, I thank you that when my husband goes out every day, God, he is more than a conqueror. My husband is a provider. My husband is strong. Holy Spirit, you speak to him throughout the day. You keep him safe. Lord, for my grandchildren, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that they know their Mimi, their Nana, their Mima loves God. The best thing that I can show anybody is that I love God. And that I'm just grateful. It takes inner strength to be fierce. When I looked at Pastor, is it Corinne from Kingman? Corinne? Karen. Karen. I have a Corinne in my leadership team. So. I love it when you say this, be fierce, be fierce. You're like, <laughs> I get that. But being fierce starts in here, not out here. Because we can, as women, yell to be heard. But when you are quiet and controlled and confident and you know who you are, you can speak with a whisper and get more command of respect than you yelling and screaming and acting a fool. Because the love of God. The love of God is my foundation and can help you reach across the bridge. I want to take the last couple of minutes. Man, I just feel the anointing. Oh, my goodness. Whew. If this ministered to you and you do have some relationships that need to be repaired, I'm not saying that you have to do the work. I'm just saying you're the conduit. I didn't do a lot of work. I prayed. I declared. And then I trusted God and I didn't give up. Because the enemy is like, those kids will never get together. Her mother, the redhead, she's beautiful. Her name is Natalie. She and my son are four months apart. So when I say die to your flesh, I'm telling you the truth. Because this is a woman I got to look in the face. We were pregnant at the same time. But if it's not important in eternity... It's not going to be important on the earth. God doesn't care that we were pregnant at the same time. We were. That's where life brought us. But I can use the love of God to reach across the breach to make sure that her daughter knows God loves you. God has a plan for you. And there's a mighty woman of God praying for you, cheering you on, defending you, who will not give up. 